thanks for coming everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Kylie Message. Uh, I'm a Senior Fellow in the HRC and Associate Dean Research in the College of Arts and Social Sciences at the ANU. I'll be chairing the Works That Shaped the World session today. I'd like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting. I'm on unceded Ngunnawal and Ngambri lands and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Works That Shape the World is a series run by ANU's College of Arts and Social Sciences and the Humanities Research Centre. It aims to give experts from diverse interdisciplinary fields a platform to shed insight into some of the astonishing creations that have shaped people's lives and how we see, hear, think and know about those. Our theme for this year's series is the medical humanities and our presentation tonight is on Malthus, Malthus and the modern world. So I'm thrilled to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Alison Bashford. Alison is Laureate Professor in History and Director of the Laureate Centre for History and Population at University of New South Wales, Sydney. Previously, she was Vera Harmsworth, Professor of Imperial and Naval History at the University of Cambridge. She's author of several books on modern population thought and co-editor most recently of New Earth Histories, which is forthcoming from Chicago Press. She's currently completing a book on the Huxleys called From Genesis to Genetics with a Scientific D Dynasty that'll be published through Penguin Random House. Alison was awarded the Dan David Prize in 2021 for her work on the history of health and medicine. Professor Bashford's work connects the history of science, global history and environmental history into new assessments of the modern world from the 18th to the 20th centuries. And this is really where her, where her lecture is situated tonight. So, by way of a preview, the talk tonight will focus on Thomas Robert Malthus and his essay on the principle of population from 1798. This book continues to have currency today as the planet approaches 8 billion people and international debate on population is again a live issue. In her lecture, Professor Bashford will explore why a controversial text from the classical political economy canon and from a pre-industrial time has endured as such a touchstone. She argues that Malthusian ideas and their discontents have endured as a policy benchmark. They have done so across massively diverse global polities, cultures and languages, including India, China, Japan and Australia for leaders and policy makers across time, including Nehru, Mao and Deakin, and for the world's global thinkers, Mill, Marx and Keynes. But this is not just a matter of the past. Experts and lay commentators, politicians and the public, proponents and opponents, continue to benchmark their views against Malthus. International economists repeatedly ask, how relevant is Malthus for economic development today? And does Malthusianism hold true? The answers are still strongly yes and strongly no. Yet the context has now changed, partly because of climate change and sustainable growth agendas, partly because fertility rates have and are continuing to fall across the globe. This essay by a modest and unassuming man is certainly a work that shaped the world. So just before I pass over to um, Professor Bashford, I might ask that you please turn off your video throughout the presentation, just to uh, stave off the network issues that we sometimes have. Also, uh, we will have questions, uh, we will have time for questions and discussion after the talk. In fact, Alison has said that she's quite um, looking forward to that. So um, I invite you to put any comments or queries in the Q&A box and I'll read those out when the time comes. But now I'd just like to thank you all again for coming and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Alison to the virtual podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kylie, for that uh, good, great introduction. Couldn't have put it better myself. 
um, and lovely to be here. And I, you know, we all love books <laughs> in this forum. And so the idea of going back to basics, as it were, and back to those books and thinking through how they change the world is the one that certainly uh, appeals to me. And it's a pleasure to um, speak to you about a book and an author that I've lived with for quite a long time now. Uh, he's been in my head and on my shelves um, for many years and I still puzzle over him. And I hear Malthus's question asked again and again, even when it's not um, in a context where, where, where non-Malthus scholars might even recognise it as derived from him. So, for example, I was at a very a, a wonderful Four Academies forum in Sydney a couple of years ago, and the, the question for the for the Academies forum, where our, our um, scholarly academies come together once a year, was: Does have Australia have an optimal population? Is a steady state society possible or desirable? And I would imagine that the word population in that first sentence would have triggered Malthus for a few people. But the second sentence, is a steady state society possible or desirable, um, is a Malthusian derived question. However, we might answer both of those questions. However, we might answer them. Uh, and of course, they can be ans answered in many ways. They're uh, both Malthusian. Uh, derived questions and they're certainly not posed for the first or last time. Um, they have in various ways been posed for uh, two, more than two centuries now. Um, as, as Kylie indicated, the answers that the answers to such questions are still strongly yes and strongly no, um, won't come as any surprise. But for the moment and for this essay, for this lecture, I want to just suspend strongly yes or strongly no. I even want to suspend an argument about the, the validity or the veracity um, of Malthus's book and simply go back to the book and back to the author and outline um, the argument, the context for its, um, the context for its production, the author, the book, I'll spend a little bit of time because of this audience talking about uh, the Australian connection. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a surprising one, or at least was surprising to me before I wrote a recent book, um, to, 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 uh, not least to explain it to myself. There's a very particular Australian connection. Uh, and, and then I'll run through the, um, the various impacts that this essay on the principal population have had. So I hope that sounds okay for the next for the next little while. And as Carly indicated, I'm very happy uh, and eager to take some uh, questions and to have some conversations. So let's begin. Um, let's begin with the author himself, and then I'll go on to the, the book, this, the production of the several editions of the book and what he's arguing. So uh, Malthus, he is one of the very, there are very few images of him. He is one that is re re reproduced um, constantly because it's one of the few that we have. Um, 1766 to 1834 are his vital dates. A lot happened in those years, of course. He, he is born when the 13 colonies of the what became the United States is still the 13 colonies. The American War happens in his lifetime. The French Revolution happens in his lifetime. The Napoleonic Wars happen in his lifetime. Um, uh, first Cook and then Philip come to the east coast of Australia in his lifetime, and we'll come back to that. Um, slavery is debated the slave trade abolished uh, in his lifetime. So these are very interesting. For someone who's writing about population, uh, uh, the, this is a very interesting set of um, vital dates. Um, people, you know, um, the thing about Malthus is I, I'm going to take it as read that people come to a lecture on Malthus already hating him. <laughs> because that, that, uh, that's, that's his reputation rightly, perhaps wrongly, perhaps in between. Um, but for many years now, um, people love to hate Thomas Robert Malthus, partly for what he said, partly for what he's associated with. Um, 
so what I'm at, what I'm going to do in this lecture is not I'm not not especially try to undo that, but in a way try to put the critique to one side and set out um, some rather less known information about him. He's not from the the English uh, orthodoxy. Um, he's born into what we might call a gentleman, or what was a gentleman's family, a family that owned land and could just have enough money to uh, um, for the firstborn sons to live off that land, just um, modest enough. Uh, but what is interesting about the Malthus family and that in a way belies his reputation as being extremely conservative, I suppose, um, is that his family is deeply connected to a, ra a French radical tradition. And actually, uh, and this means a lot in 18th century England, that he's uh, born into and educated in not um, Orthodox Church of England, but a dissenting tradition an evangelical tradition. His father was a good friend and really an acolyte of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, and of David Hume. Um, and so there's a strong connection there to French um, philosophy. Um, the father, his father sent him to, um, very unusually, to a dissenting academy, what's called a dissenting academy in, in um, Yorkshire, the, the Wakefield Academy that had produced um, highly un unorthodox uh, thinkers and then he went uh, unusual for that education he then went to Cambridge at a period when um, uh, and to the same college Jesus College where Samuel Taylor Coleridge was um, so he was he's in also in that moment of of um, of romanticism as well it makes him it's a very interesting period uh, uh, unusually because of his dissenting education and because, in fact, he wasn't christened, uh, which is a measure of his father's unorthodoxy. In fact, he takes orders, uh, Robert, Robert Malthus uh, takes orders, he preaches for a short time, he has difficulty preaching because, in fact, he's born with a, um, a quite significant um, uh, hair lip and cleft palate, had apparently had a very uh, um, significant uh, speech defect, which is not the... Um, greatest virtue for a, a preacher on a Sunday. Didn't like it, did it for a short time. And uh, even though he's often, in the kind of tradition of critique of Malthus, he's often derided as Parson Malthus, which is an early book written in opposition to his ideas, um, where the parson is meant to diminish um, and make him um, partial, I suppose. Um, but in fact, he was a parson for a very short amount of time and spent most of his life, and I think this is much more interesting, uh, he spent most of his life as a professor of political economy at the East India Company College in Halebury. And that his position there, the college, was to take young boys, men, 14, 15, 16 years old, to teach them uh, um, various Indian languages to teach them political economy, to teach them how to be clerks in the East India Company, uh, and then they're sent out to um, various parts of India and and elsewhere actually. And so for at least thirty years, that was Thomas Malthus's job, which actually makes puts him right in the heart of one of the great. Uh, drivers and machines of British imperialism. And in a way, in a way, traditionally, it's his Parson Malthus persona, which, which scholars have kind of rested on to try and critique him. But a lot of my work has been trying to twist the Malthus story into one of a high imperial and, and um, worldly context and we'll see that that was something that in fact interested him um, as well. So there he was in the East India Company College in Halebury teaching political economy to East India Company clerks and personnel and most of the time what he taught them was Adam Smith over and over and over right through till 1834. So in the, at the beginning of that period, actually before he joined the East India Company, he 
uh, he wrote a, the first edition of the book we're going to discuss, the first edition of the essay on the principle of population. There's the, there's the title page of the first edition, 1798. It's anonymous. He writes this before he joins the East India Company, uh, Company College, just. And he writes it, as you can see here, uh, in explicit uh, conversation and response to the work of William Godwin, the radical work of William Godwin, uh, and the, the work of Condorcet in France and other writers, as he puts it here. And he's writing an essay on the principle of population, and this is the important subtitle in this edition, The Future Improvement of Society. Because the future improvement of society is the, the, utop the utopian um, ambition and aim and hope for a more perfect society, um, a better world that Godwin especially is putting forward. Um, and uh, uh, Malthus who's very opposed to what's, what, this is 1798, so it's well after the revolution, but he's very opposed to what happened in the French revolutionary moments. He's quite opposed to the Enlightenment thought that fed into that, including his, that of his um, father's very good friend, Rousseau. Uh, and he writes a kind of a realist response, which argues that essentially, no matter how much we aim for or desire a society with no poverty, there is a law. And I, I always hold off calling it a law of nature, but a lot of historians of Malthus do that. I hold off and I'll come to that in a moment. There is a law that is everywhere workable that he says means that there will always be some people in poverty. Leaping to um, late for the moment's brackets, leaping to later editions, a lot of his uh, effort and purpose was put into what actually might be done about this law to minimise the number of people or to mitigate this effect, to minimise the number of people in poverty. Um, but uh, that kind of second part of his work is often ignored in favour of, um, of uh, setting out the uh, claim that he made against Godwin and against Condorcet and so forth, that we can move increasingly to a world with less poverty. So um, there, is a, there is a phrase that he used in one of his editions um, where he said, there will always be uh, people, who, essentially he said, there will always be people who cannot dine, who cannot eat at nature's table. In other words, his principle of population was that, um, and this is the well known, there is a tendency or actually a potential for human populations to double and double again. But in fact, they don't do that. He said with Benjamin Franklin, he said that doubling and doubling again is impossible precisely because there are not enough resources, there is not enough food to keep. Um, alive that incremental uh, population increase. So Malthus argued in uh, this edition and in subsequent ones that, um, that because population increase has the potential to outstrip the increase of resources and food, um, other measures kick in to keep the balance. And casting forward a century or so, this is why ecologists uh, pick up Malthus. So Malthus, people sometimes think, it's a very common misperception, that Malthus was writing about British population growth. But in fact, he wasn't. That's perceived after Malthus's time or towards the end of his life. He's not writing about population growth that we know in retrospect was actually taking place as he was writing. He is writing about the permanent cycle that changes over years and oscillates, where in good harvests you can have uh, more, more people, more children will survive, population grows, and then there'll be bad harvest and bad season, and it will come down again. And so, in fact, 
um, populations stay more or less stable, necessarily so. And he said that in nature, the means by which that stability is achieved are through um, positive and neg negative forces, um, but he says populations will decline or be kept in that balance um, through, through death by starvation or by disease or by war, and he writes also by infanticide and so forth. Um, so that's his kind of principle in a nutshell. People think it's, it was a principle brought, triggered by the, uh, the recognition that there was population growth, but it's not that at all for him. So let me just show you this, this uh, very crude slide here. So he's writing about 1800. And while we know in retrospect, there's a small increase in population. And in fact, we know in the last couple of decades, there was some increase. That great upswing in population that we're familiar with, um, this is just England, but in fact, it tracks over the world, is after Malthus's time. So he's not writing about the problem of overpopulation. He's writing about the potential for human, the potential for human, human population increase but the fact that that can never actually happen and so what keeps populations at a stable level is actually his problem so it's a common misunderstanding um, and and there's a strange there's a strange presumption i think that he's writing about population growth um, because he gets so critiqued in the 19th and 20th century but he also is used so there's his first, um, this is a kind of, in a nutshell, a book that was written in 1798 anonymously first because he knew it would be fairly um, controversial and it was, it just sold off the um, shelves extremely quickly. It was, you can see there, printed for or published by Joseph Johnson in St Paul's Churchyard. Um, Johnson is the publisher of, um, of momentarily radical but increasingly less radical but he's very much a reformer um uh but he's a, a, pu a publisher of, of Wilson, mary wollstonecraft for example uh and, and quite a few other tracks that would sit much more in the radical tradition of the 1790s he's also picking up um and publishing thomas robert malthus anonymously titled so the first edition comes off um, it's really thin, it's quite short, it's like a summary. Uh, it sells really quickly. Joseph Johnson gets back to him very quickly and says, I want another edition. Uh, can you give me something else? I'm going to do a second edition uh, as soon as you can. So precisely because it, it, it elicited so much interest so quickly, um, Thomas Robert Malthus produced the second edition in 1803. 1803, very much enlarged, he said, and that's an understatement. It's probably 10 times as long. So my, my original copy from 1803 on my shelves that I'm looking at now is, uh, I should have brought them over, there's two, two volumes about like that, uh, whereas the first volume is quite thin. Um, so it's about 10 times as long, and the content of that 10 times as long is something I'll come to um, in a minute. It features New South Wales amongst other places. So here he puts his... Um, uh, name to it this time, T.R. Malthus, Fellow of Jesus College, Cambridge, a new edition very much enlarged. The subtitles changed, uh, the, 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 the kind of framing of this in response to Condorcet and Godwin has gone, not as important anymore. A view of its past and present effects on human happiness with an inquiry into the prospects reflecting the future removal or mitigation of the evils which it occasions. Okay, so this is the second edition, and it goes on. There's this four is it four more editions after this? The final one is 1826, um, and it's never out of print. It's translated into many languages, first German, um, and there are many versions of it. Um, Oxford World's Classics, for example. Uh, the, 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 re, the, the more recent reprints quite like to reprint the first edition because it's short and leave alone the second edition because it's so long. However, quite early in the 19th century, a strange 
and given that this is a book audience, this is where I can indulge um, the traditions of publishing. There was a strange decision made, and I'm not still sure why. To excise the first three chapters of this original 1803 edition. And the first three chapters were one, a chapter on New South Wales and Aboriginal people in Sydney. Two, natives in North America, native North Americans. Three, Pacific Islanders. So these three chapters that start the long edition, the enduring edition of Thomas Robert Malthus's essay on the people got get excised. And they kind of stay out of many editions. And it becomes a kind of a publishing tradition to just leave them out, which is why, you know, many years ago now, in the strangest of places, late one jet lag night in Houston, Texas, I was wide awake, went into the 24 hour library at Rice University, browsed the economic history shelves because I was just starting to think about population at that stage, picked up an original 1803 edition of the essay on the principle of population. It fell open and there I saw two words leapt off the page. One was Hawkesbury. I thought it was going to be about Lord Hawkesbury, but it wasn't. It was about the Hawkesbury River. And then another word leapt off the page, as it would anybody in this audience, um, was the word Benelong. And I flipped back and forward because I'd, I'd known and I'd read Malthus in many republications. I never knew that he wrote about New South Wales, um, let alone Aboriginal people, let alone naming Benelong uh, and Colby by name. Uh, and I couldn't quite comprehend what this was because I thought I knew Malthus. I remember emailing um, the very learned John Gascoigne straight away and care of wonderful time differences. John was online and I said, did you know that Malthus wrote about New South Wales? And John said, no, that's curious. Uh, and that was many years ago now and I've been kind of tracking um, in some ways, the, the world history and the imperial history and the settler colonial history that, that Malthus was part of. So the reasons why, um, the reason, there's several reasons why Malthus decided to write a chapter on Aboriginal people in, this is 1803, so it's fairly early Sydney. When he was asked to write a second edition, he took on some of the critique, and a lot of the critique was, you've written a principle, um, a principle or something that you call, call a law should be able to be substantiated. And so he took that challenge and Malthus decided to essentially try and substantiate his principle of population, which he claimed worked in all time, on all people, in all places, in slightly different ways. But this principle that populations can't increase but will always match what the what resort, food and resources are in various ways uh, is applicable in all time, in all places. So, because in his mind, he wanted to write in that kind of 18th century way, I always think of him much more as a late 18th century writer than a 19th century writer all time and all places, the model that's available for him to take that on is the largely the Scottish Enlightenment tradition of universal history or stadial theorising. So the, the world all time in all places in this Scottish Enlightenment to some extent for the French as well, is a, a, a model of um, human all human history, where all human history, all societies start, and this is in economic, terms start as uh, hunter-gatherer societies move into what what Malthus actually often called a shepherd stage and Malthus I have to say brackets is a great consumer as a student was a great consumer of um, Gibbon's decline and fall which is a kind of a stadial uh, argument about the barbarians invading Europe right, running right through it so the four stages are the 
hunter-gatherer uh, or the nomadic stage, a shepherd or um, a domestic a, a society or an economy where there are domesticated animals, a stage of cultivation and a commercial a commercial stage. And uh, so this is a kind of a universal history tradition or stadial theory, it's sometimes called, which um, when Malthus wants to write about how his principle of, of population operates all over the world at all times, he reaches for that tradition. And then he reaches for other books to try and put substance to that. But the organization of his long 1803 edition is absolutely via the stages of what he would understand as universal history of human development. So he starts with what he calls the, I don't have it right on me, what he calls the lowest, lowest stages, not of civilization. The phrase of the first chapter will come to me. Um, but it is unsurprisingly, and we're very familiar with this, um, tragically, problematically in this country, that there is an idea, he picks up the idea that the earliest stages of humankind, in fact, care of 18th century voyaging, are now supposedly apparent in several parts of the world, and those three parts of the world are Tierra del Fuego, the Andaman Islands, and Aboriginal people in Van Diemen's Land in New South Wales. And so when he starts with Aboriginal people in New South Wales, he's starting at a kind of a beginning as he comprehends it. So um, let me just leave that hanging there for the moment and I'll come back to it because there's another Australian connection. When Malthus, let me just go back here. So this is what's called the old library at Jesus College, Cambridge. And through that secret door there is what's now called the Malthus Collection, which has the wonderful, quite modest, but wonderful um, library that was his father's and that, that uh, he, had, he added to as well. And it's quite interesting as a modest late 18th century gentleman's library. One of the things in that library to flip through is what's in the middle there. Uh, Malthus's and Malthus's father's copies of Cook's with an E Voyage, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Um, and that, it, it, it's actually Hawksworth's version of Cook's Voyage. And you can see there Fos Foster's Voyage as well. I'll leave that out for the moment. So Malthus decides he's going to write a universal history of all humankind and apply his principal population to it. He reaches up and pulls down Cook's account of voyages. In fact, it's Hawksworth's, as we know, amalgamating both Cook and Banks together. And he reads that, and uh, this is his own copy of that, or his family's copy of that. Um, it's very well known, of course, to historians in, a, in Australia. Um, and to his, he reads through it very carefully. And what is so odd in so many ways when you read Malthus's essay in the original is that pages and pages of it are in fact him quoting a range of other sources. So it's in fact him quoting other books. So whole pages of it are just lifted and it's putting, it's not plagiarizing, he's putting it in, he's citing it, putting it in the vertical commas, but he picks up Cook and he, um, uh, and he uh, just reprints that as part of his uh, essay, which is quite a surprise really to find Cook and Banks and Hawksworth essentially reprinted in Malthus's essay. The reason why I'm um, emphasizing this is I, I still think the quite stunning discovery that when Malthus reads Cook, he reads Cook, Banks, Hawksworth together, remarking on how few Aboriginal people there were as he sailed up and down the East Coast. Now, I know we can respond to that in many ways, but for the moment, I'm sticking to what Malthus derives from Cook. So Cook writes um, that this was a very thinly populated country, and then that's interesting enough, but this is when Ma I imagine Malthus himself sitting up. Cook writes, um, by what means, the population is kept so low, I'm, I'm not quoting directly, 
Cook says something like, by, by what means the, co the population is kept so low or so thin is mysterious. We don't know how that happens. So how can, essentially Cook is wondering, how can there be so, by what means are there so few people? Why are there so few people? How is the population kept low? And of course, that's what makes Malthus really interested. So he's thinking, ah, the, you know, the population is kept low because it's a combination of economy, hunter gathering, what's available in the environment. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of what would later be called an ecological reason for a small population. So this small population in this instance has to be kept low to be kept in balance with the capacity to gather food. So, but what's super interesting is that several times in the essay on the principal population, Mal Malthus, and he does say this more than once, Malthus says, the question, and I think this is really important, the question that Cook asked of Aboriginal Australia is the question that I'm asking of the whole world. So in other words, in other words, Malthus is saying, my entire project is derived from the question that was cooked, that, that passed Cook's mind um, when he commented on the thin population of Aboriginal people in Australia. That's the question that I'm asking the whole world. And he proceeds to do so. So he writes this chapter on, on, on um, New South Wales, I'll come back to this chapter on Native Americans, chapter on, he does a world history, kind of a world economic history. Uh, chapter on uh, Pacific Islands, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and then there's a chapter on India and Tibet. There's a chapter on Persia. There's a chapter on China. There's a chapter on Africa. There's a chapter on ancient Greece and Rome in that weird space-time way in which they could flip from place to time. Uh, uh, there's a chapter then on all of the different parts of Europe. So essentially he does a, a world history um, substantiating his ideas about population. Um, you know, in, in all kinds of erroneous and rushed uh, uh, and incorrect, incorrect ways. Um, so, and we might talk about this if you want to in questions. The one place that I noted when I wrote a book about this with Joyce Chaplin, the one place that really importantly Malthus does not write about is the West Indies. And this means that he doesn't discuss in a political economy book about population. He doesn't in fact address British slave trading or slavery. And I can come to that later if you want to, but it's the kind of absolutely telling omission. So he reaches for Cook when he, for his, his first chapter, uh, uh, he's writing in 1803, so Sydney is how, however old, you know, a decade and a half old. He's quite interested in what's happened in the meantime from Cook to what he obviously knows is the, um, the new penal colony. And he reaches for a couple of people, but mainly he reaches for David Collins's account of the English colony in New South Wales, which was published in 1798, the same year that his first edition comes out. It's not in the first edition at all, um, but when he does this long edition, he reaches for this. And this is where he learns about Benelong uh, and Colby, and he puts them by name in the essay on the principle of population. And the kind of extraordinary thing is that um, we know that Benelong uh, traveled to London. Uh, and in fact, um, I've, I've, all I want, <laughs> one day there'll be a hypothetical history I'll write about how Benelong and Malthus met. Um, but I haven't been able to quite put them together. But I think I, um, because we know so much about Benelong's um, time in London, because all the receipts for every or everything he did were are in queue, and we know that he went to Covent Garden Theatre quite a lot, and Malthus, at, Malthus went to the theatre all the time, and I'm pretty sure they went and saw the same play more or less the same night. So I like to imagine them there in Covent Garden at the theatre at the same time. Um, and so there's a kind of a fascinating that he mentions Benelong in particular, and he picks up Benelong and writes about Benelong from David Collins, 
is just so um, powerful and poignant and rich because it was Ben Long in particular who went to Malthus's uh, London, as we know. So there's a really surprising, um, you know, in some senses, or in many ways, horrific, in other ways, predictable, in other ways, quite fascinating chapter on Aboriginal people in New South Wales. Um, then there's a third chapter uh, where he reaches for Cook again, and that's about the Pacific Islands. He writes about Easter Island from Cook. He writes, a, he stops and spends quite a lot of time writing about Tahiti. And one of the reasons Malthus wrote about Tahiti is that Cook himself was quite interested in how it may be possible to estimate the number of people on Tahiti. Uh, and, um, and that's part of what Malthus is quite interested in. This is Cook's chart. One of the ways Cook thinks that it might be possible to do a kind of a census, there are no censuses yet, there's in, in England in any case. One of the ways think, Cook thinks, and Malthus repeats this, that the, the population might be um, estimated from is the number of men on the canoes and then estimate the number of households, the number of people in households that those men um, uh, would belong to. And so it's in, in some ways it's actually anticipating the household census model. Uh, there's the book that I've written about this. All right, before I go on to impact, Kylie, I have no watch about me. What's the time? Um, it's quarter to six, so okay. Okay. keep going. Okay, a little, tiny bit longer. So one of the things I do want to say, even before I go into the, the impact, which I'll whiz through, it's pretty, I think it's pretty important and interesting for us in Australia. Let me go back to the first here. There's a sentence in this very much enlarged edition where he says, I think quite a curious and surprising thing. He says, um, and he's talking partly about North America, but essentially it's a description of settler colonialism. So Martha says, um, we, send, uh, we send people to other people's places and there the po our population um, increases very rapidly. And he says, essentially the, the effect is to exterminate uh, the local people. And I think by that, actually, he means um, a geographical sense of extermination, so a removal. Uh, and he's writing about North America um, at, at this time. Um, but he says that that's the effect of us going there, is that, that the people who were there are exterminated um, to places where they will starve, he says. Uh, and then he says, this will be questioned, this will be questioned in a moral view. And it's not something that he pursues, and there's no claim for Malthus to be some kind of precocious anti-colonialist on my part. Nonetheless, there's a recognition, I think there's an important recognition, and kind of a surprising one, given his reputation, given his reputation here, so this is a classic kind of critique of Malthus, um, you know, that we all know and we've all, all, all grown up with. And so it's quite curious to find him in this book from 1803, at the very least troubled enough by the removal to places where they will starve, the extermination of people to places where they will starve, by virtue of us going there um, and, uh, and reproducing. Um, that that is something that he notes. He doesn't say much else about it. Uh, nonetheless, it is there right framing um, very, very early on in his book. All right, I'm going to whiz over some of the impacts of this book. First of all, Darwin picks him up. You know, this is a well known story. Um, I'm not, not going to, actually, I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to describe it. Um, Darwin in the Beagle, uh, you know, gathers all his evidence. And he also says later, he, he picks up Malthus. He was, he he'd probably read Malthus at Cambridge. Most people would by the 1820s and 30s. Um, 
so Malthus's principle would be fairly canonical reading, picks up, picks up the essay on the principle of relation and reads this idea that it's impossible for populations to increase um, because there's not enough food for them. So there will always be individuals that will die. And that's the case in any species. So Malthus, Malthus himself says, in, in any species can't double and double again because the world, uh, the world, if it doubles and doubles again and everybody survives, the world would have run out of room, you know, uh, space, you know, uh, thousands of years before. So there is an impossibility to that. So it is, though, so it is necessary that a certain number of any species, in hu including humans, will die in order to keep that balance. And that's the idea that Malthus picks up and turns into the struggle for existence that there will always be some infant mortality, let's call it that, of any species. And in that gap, that's where natural selection um, takes place. So there's, you know, a massive, massive um, talk about books that change the world. Uh, it's it's in, deep inside the origin of species. It's deep inside Darwin's descent of man, brackets, actually where Darwin talks about Van Diemen's land and white people reproducing and pushing, pushing out Aboriginal people. That's where, that's the section of Descent of Man where Darwin recalls Malthus, interestingly. Um, really quickly, what happens to Malthus's idea of the 19th century, kind of leaping over the 19th century, there's this Malthusian league and people who call themselves Malthusians around the 1880, 1870s, 1880s, they're, very, they're quite strong, they're quite radical. Um, this is Annie Besant, she's just one of the very well known ones, but you can see in her book, her book, The Law of Population, how derivative that is from straight away, The Law of Population, first laid, laid down this country by the Reverend T. R. Malthus in his great work. And then she extends it. Um, what these Malthusians in a nutshell were, where they were different from Malthus. Malthus said there is, there is this law that uh, where there, there needs to be some balance. How that balance happens is kind of up for grabs. Um, Malthus himself said the solution is that men should choose to marry much later and then fertility will drop. That's his solution. Uh, Annie Besant, the, the Malthusians here, it's much more what we recognize as Malthusian. They're saying, uh, delay of marriage is not effective, but various forms of contraception within marriage is the thing that will drop um, uh, birth rates and that will reduce um, suffering and that will bring the population down. This is their argument and standard of standards of living will rise. And so this is the generation where Malthusian argument becomes uh, fold folds into birth, uh, much more familiar kind of birth control lobbying. That's picked up in the 1920s and 30s. This is the first World Population Conference in Geneva. In fact, it's organised and entirely by Margaret Sanger. Um, but Margaret Sanger, in who's very well known, I'm sure, to all of you, Margaret Sanger herself um, organises this single-handedly. Uh, runs a conference in Geneva, the, but decides that it's for scientists only, and she steps back. She organises it and then never speaks at it and steps back completely and creates this forum for men of science to come to Geneva. And essentially that's a lobbying exercise to try and get population birth control of various kinds onto the League of Nations um, agenda. So the... The, the men of science here all understand population to be their, their question, but they range from geographers to lawyers to early ecologists to physiologists, some physicians, some of them are birth control lobbyists, some aren't, but there's this incredible um, disciplinary range. But they will all have read Malthus and they will all kind of be basing their scientific, their demographic, it's kind of just at the beginning of demography, their demographic work and their economic work on Malthus. Um, there is a massive, and, and I'm sure everybody will be familiar with this, nonetheless these works really deserve rereading 
It was a bit like Malthus's original book. They're, they're not often what you, like from the tradition that we imagine and they say different things sometimes to what we presume. Um, but after the Second World War, there's a kind of a rise and rise of neo, what's called neo-Malthusianism. Um, and it's deeply, deeply connected to the origins of environmentalism, uh, both within nations, but also a, a, a global political ecology, essentially. In 1948, Fairfield Osborne writes The Limits of the Earth and then Our Plundered Planet. Um, William Vogt there on the right, first authors, a book called Road to Survival, and then this book, People, What Danger Does Mankind Face That Is Greater Than the H-Bomb? So this is the mo moment when, and we can see uh, this edition of Our Plundered Planet, the terrifying bestseller about mankind's gravest menace. So this is, it starts 1948, runs through to 1968, really into the early 70s, I suppose, this era of high neo-Malthusianism. And you can see by these jackets and you can see by the subtitles that this is an era of high global catastrophe. Population bombs and H-bombs are increasingly connected. Um, this is a key origin point for global environmentalism because population is about soil, is about food. Other way around, population is about food and therefore about soil. So these people, our plundered planet is about an env a deeply environmentalist text about soil desiccation, about how growing populations encroach on habitats, um, create deserts, um, use up water, uh, cause starvation, and cause war. Uh, and so there is a deep connection that doesn't need the dots. This is a generation where the dots don't need to be drawn, both for this generation and this generation, the link between overpopulation, as it's now called, uh, 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 food security, war, and peace, uh, nobody has to put any explanation into why those things are connected for this generation. That's entirely obvious to them. It drives um, a lot of pacifism. It drives a huge amount of environmentalism. And this is a, cat, a moment of, um, it's a familiar, you know, it's a, we, we know about this. It's a very familiar kind of discourse post-war. Uh, it leads to, you know, the most famous Neo-Malthusian text, um, Ehrlich's population bomb. This is a revised edition. Note that it's published by the Sierra Club, the environmentalist uh, organization, we might call it. While you're reading these words, five people, mostly children, have died of starvation, 40 more have been born. And it leads directly to limits of growth, um, which is produced by the Club of Rome. And I think, I, I, I think that you know, leading into some of our conversation, if we're talking about a book that changed the world, on the one hand, the critique, uh, especially the Marxist critique of Malthus is well known and enduring, and a kind of immediate response to Malthus. Um, and but that, uh, that critique doesn't help us understand the other line that comes through that, and that we receive, whether we like it or not, in environmentalism. And actually, I think as the immediate precursor to a vocabulary, a way of acting, a way of thinking whole planet, a way of thinking danger, a way of thinking possible future annihilation and what is this generation going to do about it. This is the generation that is the immediate precursor to uh, uh, um, the language, the possibilities of uh, climate change and Anthropocene discussion. So they lead immediately. It, it's not a, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a history of that way of thinking that is usually disavowed because of the critique of Malthus. Nobody wants, of course, nobody wants to be connected to Malthus or population control. And so there's a disavowal of it. Nonetheless, it's this generation especially and in a way, there is a kind of a harking back now to limits to growth, 
Um, and so there's more of an interesting, uh, but quite uncomfortable connection between Neo-Malthusianism of this period and our discussion um, today, even if the question of population itself has interestingly kind of dropped away from, uh, certainly dropped away from uh, current discussion about planetary uh, catastrophe in a way that this earlier generation here, not to mention this one, wouldn't recognise at all. So this is one 20th century kind of uh, trajectory, I suppose, of, and for Malthus, an entirely unexpected one, but certainly um, a really influential, for better or worse, trajectory, especially of this book here, the second long edition of um, Malthus's essay on the principle of population. So I think I'll leave it there, and thank you very much for listening.